Raffles by E. W. Horner. A series of short stories dramatized for radio by David Buck, with Jeremy Clyde as Raffles and Michael Cochran as Bunny. The Field of Philippi. Doesn't the sight of those colours take you back, Bunny? Hmm. It does, unfortunately. What's this? Don't you feel any affection for the old place? I must confess, AJ, that I wouldn't care if I never saw it again in my life. We stood on the platform at Houston, Raffles and I, waiting to take our seats on the train which was to take us back to school. For my companion had rashly broken one of his self-imposed rules and had undertaken to play for the old boys in their annual match against the school's first eleven. I, much against my will, had agreed to accompany him. Glancing around me at our fellow passengers, many of whom wore the old school colours, but none of whom I recognised, I began to regret my decision. You're in a very sour mood this morning, Bunny, if I may say so. Look about you, man, at these solid citizens with whom you have so much in common. Huh? Look behind those whiskers and spectacles and fat cigars and en bon point and see the boy eternal. I can't do it, Raffles, and I'm not sure I want to. Amuse yourself by thinking how many bushy bourgeois eyebrows would be raised if you were to inform them how you came by that watch and chain or that cigarette case of yours. Hush, Raffles. I must confess, I often have it in my mind to climb to the top of a high building and shout aloud, Gentlemen, do you recall the case of the Thimbleby Diamonds? Not so loud. <laughs> or the break-in at Danby the Jewellers? Raffles, I beg no? you. Well, then what about the theft of the Melrose necklace? AJ, people will hear. Well, I would shout the police, or more particularly Inspector Mackenzie of the Yard, believe that all these crimes and several more besides are the work of the same hand. Nonsense, you say? No, it is not nonsense. For I can confirm this theory. They were all the work... Uh, Raffles, now there's a demon in you today, and if you don't exorcise it pretty soon, I swear you'll be travelling up on your own. <laughs> Wouldn't be polite, Bunny. Not after I've bought the tickets. Here, this looks a likely compartment. Oh. Now. Oh. Where's that damn porter got to with our luggage? Oh, here, here he comes, AJ. There you are, Governor. Ooh. Ah, thanks. No, wait till I tell him at home that I've carried your kit for you, Mr. Raffles. So you follow the game, then. Oh, when I can, sir. When I saw you bowl the great Dr. Grace for a duck once, well, the crowd went half mad, they did. Ah, yes. Well, you're going back a few years, my friend. At our last encounter, sad to say, he smote me hip and thigh. Well, we all of us has our off days. Oh, <laughs> even railway porters. <laughs> Give the man half a crown, Bunny. The Raffles. I... Well, thank you kindly, Mr. Raffles. And there. Uh... Oh. <laughs> may I uh, wish you fair weather, sir, and uh, a good turning wicket. Uh, you may. You may. Now, with a bit of luck, we may keep this compartment to ourselves. But, but I, I thought you wanted to mingle, Raffles. Once we're there, I swear I'll mingle with the best will in the world. But I prefer to travel in silence. Even when I was a lad, I painted measles on my face to keep a compartment empty. <laughs> uh, pass me the paper, will you, old man? But the idyllically silent journey of my friend's desire was not to be. As the time of departure approached, the compartment filled with middle-aged gentlemen wearing the familiar colours of our old school. Calthorpe, isn't it? I beg your pardon? Oh, don't you remember me? Bodley. Bodley Turts. Good heavens. Buffy! The same! Oh, oh, you put on a bit of weight since we last met, eh? Hey, you're not exactly Apollo yourself, old man. Ah, well. What's happened to that thatch of red hair you used to have, eh? Gone no back. one would call you carrots now, oh. eh? <laughs> oh, look! There's Lapwing, if oh. I'm not mistaken. Oh, hi there! Lolly, old chap! Oh, hey. Come in here! <laughs> Plenty of room! Come on in, Pip! Oh. Hand me your back! Oh. Come on in, oh. The journey was Gehenna to my sensitive soul. Raffles, however, always the most sociable of men, determined to enter into the spirit of the event, and before the train set us down at our destination, was swapping stories with the best of them, as if he were their boon companion, and sought no better company. down the wicket, snorted, and glanced a leg. I say, that's a good one. I've never heard a better Oh, you're a good fellow, Raffles, and no mistake. Why haven't you joined us every year? No pressures of work, you know. No, what exactly yes. do you do, old man? Uh, besides the cricket, I mean. Uh, Raffles. Uh, I'm nice a sort suggested. of financier. Oh. Ah, oh, you know. It's a dashed interesting line of country, that. Unchanged, do I take it? Not exactly. 
Where do your interests lie then? In the redistribution of wealth. Oh, excellent. Rob the rich and give to the poor, eh? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Well, I shan't press you further. You financial genres are all so damn close. But I guess you're turning up this weekend to see about the fund. Fund? What fund? <laughs> oh. There you see. <laughs> Butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Oh. By George Ravels, I'll wait till you play an excellent hand of poker. <laughs> well, we'll save that for the return journey, but please won't anyone tell me what fund. <laughs> Perhaps he really doesn't know. Well, then you'd better tell him, old boy. Well, next year's the old school's bicentenary, and I'm sure you know. Yeah. It's been proposed that some of us should subscribe to Mark this epoch with some suitable tribute in bronze. Yes. To wit, a statue of our pious thunder. <laughs> well, what do you think of the plan? It's an excellent idea. <laughs> I'm all for statues and such, and so is Bunny. Aren't you, old chap? <laughs> Me? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, well, well, may we put your names on the subscription list? Of course, of course. Put us both down. Uh, but Raffles... Uh, oh, what's more, we'll do our best to spread the word. See if we can't come up with something special to celebrate 200 years of Birch and Willow. Ah. <laughs> well, as I recall, our founder was rather a severe-looking old cove. Absolutely. I'd give a lot to put a smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our friend here has such a gift of the gab, I think we should ask him to speak at our meeting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Meeting? Yeah. What meeting? Well, the meeting we've called to discuss this proposal, we're holding it tomorrow in assembly. After stumps are drawn. Oh, now, hold on. I'm not much of a one for meetings and things of that sort. Nonsense. Oh. Just tell them what you told us. Get them laughing. That's the secret. <laughs> and then they'll soon cough up the reddies. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>《You've gone too far. Not only have you saddled us with a thumping great subscription... Well, no you... sums were mentioned, old man. But they didn't need to be. These are rich, prosperous men, Raffles. They'll expect more than a couple of sobs, you know. Oh, I think they'll be grateful for anything we can give them. We can't even afford that, AJ. I don't think you've any idea how badly off we are. Well, how badly off are we, Bunny? We've bills a yard long at the club for a start, and rents to pay, well, not we'll to mention... We'll put something the... in hand as soon as we return, I promise. That's one or two little plans I have afoot. Oh... But I must confess, this idea of a statue appeals to something deep in my soul. I've always loved the things. One of my earliest memories is of my father taking me to see the Nelson Monument unveiled in 67. I've always regretted that no one's ever put up a statue to one in my line of business. No, I don't think that's likely to change, Raffles. But imagine it, Bunny. Dick Turpin or Captain Kidd or spring Heel Jack celebrated in stone. Charlie Peace immortalised in bronze. I'd go a long way to see such a thing. I dare say you would. Uh, but meanwhile, I must be content to ensure that the old school lays on something special for its beloved and virtuous founder. Whatever his name was. Uh, good Lord. Right. Isn't that Soapy Sudborough? My heart sank as I beheld the approach of a tall and ungainly figure, the stolid set of whose lantern jaw aroused in me many an unpleasant and painful memory. You're right. It's that rotter Sudborough who used to be head prefect in my first year. Oh, he's given me more thrashings than I care to remember. Hey, don't let him see us. Oh, why not? He won't thrash you now, Bunny, I promise. I shan't let him. But that's not the point, Raffles. The man was a stiff-necked, pig-headed, self-opinionated brute. And probably still is. People like Sudborough seldom change for the better. I had no cause to love him either, Bunny. He tried to have me expelled once, damn his eyes. But that's water under the bridge. We mustn't persist in these ancient feuds. Let's give the fellow a chance, eh? Hey there, Soapy! Soapy! Were you shouting at me? Well, there's no one else in the immediate neighbourhood, Soapy old scout, so I suppose I was. My name is Sudborough, sir. I knew it must be you. The way you hold your head as if you had a nasty smell under your nose, it hasn't changed, you know. <clears throat> soapy Sudbra, I said. Old Soapy Sudbra, as I live and suffocate, didn't I, Bunny? Uh, yes, you did, AJ. I don't think I have the pleasure of your acquaintance, sir. Uh, there's really no need to sir me, you know, Soapy. <laughs> it's your old friend, Raffles. AJ Raffles, remember? I was captain of cricket when you were head of school. Really? Perhaps. I don't recall... I was never much interested in cricket. And you can't expect someone who had my responsibilities to remember every Tom, Dick... And, and Harry, you were going to say. Well, let me remind you of one of them. Harry Manders here. Uh, if you don't remember Raffles, Sudbra, you're even less likely to remember me. <laughs> I dare say, I dare say. Are you off so soon? We'll walk along with you, if you don't mind. Well, I can't stop you. <laughs> Do you know... Even after a dozen years or so, I'm really surprised you don't remember me, soapy old chum. 
You reported me to the head at one time for smoking and gadding about the town of an evening. Uh-huh. Fortunately, the old man cared more for the performance of the cricket eleven than for the niceties of schoolboy behaviour, and I was let off with a flogging. Hmm. Are you sure you don't remember me? Or even young Manders here? I have rather more pressing matters to think about. Well, so have I, to be frank. But some memories persist, you know. Didn't your father run the local bank? Sudbury's? It's Sudbury and Sons now. Indeed. My congratulations. In the provinces, an ampersand is as good as a title, I'm told. Sudbury and Sons, eh? <laughs> Think of that, Bunny. And now I must mm. keep an appointment with the headmaster. He often calls on me for advice. Goodbye, gentlemen. Well, of all the... Uh, yes, Bunny, you were going to say? The pompous patronising swine. <laughs> well, why didn't you punch him on the nose or throttle him? Well, my fingers itched a little, I must admit. But I remembered in time that our mission here is one of goodwill and comradeship. Not to remember you. I mean, the best cricketer the school ever had. Oh, he recognised me all right, Bunny. But I'm a ghost from his past, and the easiest way with ghosts is to pretend they don't exist. Uh -huh. Do you remember how Caesar appeared to Brutus before the big battle? Told him he would see him at Philippi? He did, too. The ghosts from one's past are persistent creatures. You turn your back on them, but there they are, breathing over your shoulder. They don't like to leave old scores unsettled. Why are you smiling? Well, I can't see that Sudbra is much in common with Brutus, AJ. Eh, <laughs> Nor I with Caesar. <laughs> I'm not dead for a start, <laughs> and I was never much of a hand at Latin. <laughs> no, well, perhaps I'm taking it all rather too seriously. We came here for the game, and the game we shall have. All the same, I think if I imagine the ball tomorrow to be Sudbury's fat head, I might come up with a six or two. Alas for his hopes. When a great cricketer plays out of his class, the occasional reversal is to be expected. The following morning, Raffles was bowled for a duck, and most of the afternoon his bowling was lustily hit by a delighted school eleven into every corner of the field. However, not even this indignity seemed to dampen his spirits. That evening, in the big assembly hall, he addressed the old boys with great humour and aplomb. <laughs> so I ask you gentlemen to dig deep into your pockets, your wallets, your purses, and I do not exempt the time on a teapot or the old sock hidden under the bed. Wherever you're pleased to keep your money, even if it rests in no lesser place than the Bank of England, nay, even if it be in the safekeeping of Sudbury. And son, I beg you will spare a little of it for such a worthy call. Everyone's support is needed. The well-off and the not-so-well-off, and that is why we have decided that there will be no fixed subscription. All contributions will be anonymous. Simply place your copper or silver or gold in the big cricket cup, also known as the Rose Bowl, which you'll see in the lobby as you leave the hall. It's our aim to fill that pot, gentlemen, with Her Majesty's portrait. The more, the merrier. Do you wish to speak, Mr. Sudbury? Uh, yes. Uh, forgive me, gentlemen. I fear I cannot compete with Mr. Raffles in the matter of achieving easy laughter. But I hope to introduce a breath of common sense into this somewhat emotional debate. Sudbury spoke, I later learned, for over an hour. He spoke with great vigour at the top of his voice. Why, he asked, spend money on a man who had been dead 200 years? What good could it do him or the school? Besides, he was only technically the founder. He had not founded a great public school. He had merely founded a little country grammar school, which had pottered along for a century and a half. The great public school was the growth of the last 50 years, and no credit to the man we proposed to celebrate in bronze. He spoke well and I had no doubt that many present were persuaded by his arguments. Raffles listened with furrowed brow at the back of the hall for ten minutes or so. Then I saw him slip away. As soon as I felt I could, I too withdrew from the meeting and went in search of him. I found him in the dormitory corridor by the very window where so often in the past I had waited for him to return from one of his nocturnal exploits. Raffles? Ahoy there! A rope coming down now, Raffles. Splendid. Thank you, Manders. Oh, lack of day. I fear I've 
something less than my usual sure foot itself tonight. I knocked over something rather noisy in crossing dear old Nabs's garden to... Ten to one, it roused him. He'll be on my tail. Hurry up, then. Less than my sure foot itself. Too loud, Ruffles. The jacket? Yes, I suppose it is. But dash it all, it's not your place, boy, to criticise. Hush! What is it? Someone's coming up the stairs. Nabs? I think so. Quickly, then. No, wait. The other way, this way. How do you know? I sprinkled sugar on the left-hand stair. Dear it's old gone the long Nabsy way McNabb. <laughs> he never caught me. That was the closest he ever came, and he failed thanks to you. You were a brick in those days, Bunny, and a brick you've remained. A man never had a better friend. This man did, Raffles. <laughs> you know, I've a mind to make the run again to town and back, just for old time's sake, you know. Only this time... You can come with me. Oh, but Raffles, I really Indulge an old man's whim this once, eh, Bunny? It never was much of a drop, and now there's flower beds to break our fall. It was cobbles then, I remember. I watched him drop into the shadows, and only hesitated a moment before following him. Good. This way. It was dark by now, and the street lamps were lit in the little town. For a while we walked aimlessly through the empty streets, enjoying the peace and the silence. Then Raffles suddenly stopped. We're here. Where? Our destination, Bunny, old man. The field of Philippi, where old scores are settled. Raffles, I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. You will, Bunny, you will. Now, give me a leg up, there's a good fella. Where are we? At the back wall of Sudbury's. Or Sudbury and Sons, I should say. Bankers of this parish. Now, no more questions, Bunny, and give me a hand. In a trice he was over the wall and had pulled me up after him. Together we crouched in a small walled garden at the rear of what looked for all the world like a private house. I thought as much, Bunny. These small provincial banks are not like those battleships we have in town. I've always balked at tackling one of those from the outside, as you know. This is simply a bricks and mortar job. We'll have it open in a trice. Even as he spoke, he was up and working at the catch of a window with his penknife. And soon I heard that old metallic snap, followed by the raising of a sash so slowly and gently as to be almost inaudible. Best you wait here, Bunny. Huh? Oh, no point having two sets of feet to trigger the alarms, if alarms there be. Now, if there's any trouble from outside, don't stand on ceremony. Just give a loud whistle to warn me, and then leg it over into the next garden and back to school. But don't you need any help? I hope not for the moment. But later, if all goes well, I'll need a pair of strong arms. Oh. <laughs> Jove, but the stars are bright tonight. Should have brought your telescope, old man. And with that he vanished into the darkness of the deserted building. The minutes passed like hours, though I have the confirmation of my watch that only a quarter had elapsed before Raffles was by my side once more, and I saw the gleam of his teeth in the moonlight as he smiled in satisfaction. A goodish haul, Bunny, and all with skeleton keys. Everything's back as I found it. Do you know, I believe I've been wasting a great deal of raw cunning in town all this time, while the good burghers of the provinces have been waiting with open arms for their safes to be cracked. And this place had everything but welcome inscribed on the mat. Here, I said I needed some strong arms. Take this bag. Uh, right. And this. Oh. Uh, and this. Good Lord. <laughs> uh, the initials are Sudbras. Like a good fellow, he stows his luggage neatly in the attic. You see? He was even thoughtful enough to provide us with means of transportation. Mm -hmm. I've a nasty feeling I misjudged our soapy friend, Bunny. At heart, he's the most helpful of fellows. We made our way back to the school through deserted streets, and an odd couple we must have looked laden with luggage enough for the grand tour itself. Here's the gate. Now we're home and dry. Now to see if the meeting's still in progress. Sudbra was well into his stride when we left, and good for another 40 minutes at least. Right. No, no, wait! It's pointless to carry more than we need, and these bags weigh a ton. I hide all but one in the bushes here. We'll come back for them later. There, that's the ticket. Now, oh, follow me. We legged it around the courtyard, flitting from shadow to shadow, until we stood beneath the open windows of the assembly hall. To our relief, the meeting was still in progress. The man's still talking, thank the Lord. But now it's just a matter of dumping these sovereigns in the Rose Bowl and making our way back into the hall by another route. Uh, wait here for me, Bunny. No. Eh? You are quite insufferable sometimes, Raffles. 
You seem to think it's a sort of divine right of yours to take all the risks. Well, I'm supposed to sit on the boundary and applaud. What's got into you, Bunny? I've had enough. I want to take some risks for a change. By all means, my old rabbit. What do you want to do? Well, um, I'll take the money in. Very well, old sport, but it's not something that's fraught with hazards, you know. Well, it will do. Now, give me the case. Very well. Yeah. I shan't be a minute. Elated by my sudden attack of bravado, I moved fleetly across the last open stretch of the courtyard, hovered for a second in the porch, then pushed open the swing doors of the assembly block and entered the panelled lobby, where the names of every first eleven for the past fifty years were meticulously inscribed like so many laundry lists, and wall and shelf were aglow with the polished silver of a score or so of trophies. In the centre of this display, its pièce de résistance, as it were, stood the great silver rose bowl of the Interhouse Cricket Trophy, inscribed with the name of every winning team and its captain. Raffles' name I knew featured prominently upon it, and I smiled to realise that this, in his eyes, contributed considerably to the jest in hand. I reached up to deposit my treasure inside it, when suddenly the door of the assembly hall opened and Sabra himself appeared, looking more than usually self-satisfied, the imaginary smell beneath his nostrils raising his head to even greater heights. He turned aside to find his hat and coat among the overcrowded pegs. In those few seconds, I jammed the case I carried firmly into the rose bowl and was out of the doors as if every hound in hell snapped at my heels. Well, did you do it? Yes. You know, Raffles, I've changed my mind. I think I'll be quite content to leave the dangerous stuff to you in future. Dangerous? Huh. Sabra, look, get yes, down. I flatter myself I got that point across rather well. Mm -hmm. I don't think he noticed anything. No, I dare say he's too full of himself to notice anything more subtle than a full charge of cavalry. Good. Our luck's holding. We're now to collect our own spoils and root them indoors as soon as we can. Ah, there are the cases, just as we left. Let me... Oh, thank you. I've had enough thrills for one evening, Bunny. I propose we play safe and re-enter the old dormitory corridor in time-honoured fashion, hauling our loot in after us. It's dark enough, no one will see. Ah, but uh, There's a score of places to hide it overnight. Then we'll deal with the problem of shifting it in the morning. I think we might catch the milk train. I'm sure that old Calthorpe and Bodley and Lapwing ain't the sort to travel without a good breakfast inside them, so we'll avoid having company on the journey. Ah, there's the window of the dorm straight ahead. And still open, by golly, we've made it, Bunny. Not so fast, my young friends. It's many years I've been seeking to catch you red-handed, and I've been mickle patient, you can, but now the game is up. Inspector Mackenzie. Eh? What's that? I think not, Bunny. Don't you recognise the voice of our old adversary? Yes, I'm and, uh... plagued you don't recognise me, young sirs. Ah, but I do, Mr McNabb. Nabs! I can well, that's what you used to call me, my fine friend. Nabs by name and nabs by nature, eh? I've waited many a year to catch you, Raffles, and it was a source of great frustration. I never landed you during your school days when I could have thrashed that insolent young hide of yours. Ah, never mind. I've done it at last and I can die happy. Not for many years yet, I hope. Ah, well, I keep myself a trim and I chase the present lads once in a while and uh, nab one or two of them now and again. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never had a worthy adversary like you were, Mr Raffles. Oh, and you gave me the best run for my money I ever had, sir. But what are you up to now, may I ask? Why are you creeping around with those bags? A sort of practical joke, isn't it, Bunny? Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much. I uh, mind you were full of them. Now, I insist you come back to my house for a wee dram and a talk over old times. Well, I... Not another word. I insist. We sat for an hour in Nab's room, drinking his excellent whisky, the three heavy bags on the floor between us as a constant reproach to the secret life we now led, Raffles and I. As soon as we thought that the laws of polite behaviour had been well satisfied, we thanked our amiable host and left. We returned to the dormitory and hid our loot as well as we were able, then set off for the meeting once more. As we approached the place, we were surprised to hear voices uplifted in song. Ruffles and Lambeth 
to. Where have you been? We've been looking for you everywhere. Well, need a spot of fresh air, don't you know? Uh, and you deserved it, old fellow. You deserve whatever you wish. Yeah. We're home and dry, old chap. Absolutely. We've done it, old chap. We've collected enough for the statue. We've collected <laughs> enough for two statues. <laughs> and we believe it was your oratory that swayed it. Uh, 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 but I thought that Sudbro was... Difficult to tell about the fellow. I must say he seemed all again it when he spoke. Get them blow me down if he didn't come up with the most princely stuff. But wasn't it all meant to be anonymous? Absolutely right, old man. But the fellow left his contribution in a bag. He and that bag had his initials on it. So you see, anonymity went right out of the window, so to speak. What a splendid fellow he is. Don't you agree, Rebels? Quite so. Yes, <laughs> splendid. Look, they're cheering him. Let's join in. Oh, oh, oh. Bunny. Uh, yes, Raffles? Tell me it's not true. You didn't leave the money in the bag. There was nothing else for it, Raffles. Oh. He almost caught me as it was. I mean, why? Does it matter? Well, it depends. Sudbra might easily put two and two together. But no, perhaps not. But look at the fellow, Bunny. He's quite at sea. No one's ever hoisted him on their shoulders before or called him a jolly good fellow. I believe he'll let things rest. To have such admiration thrust upon one is the headiest of drafts. <laughs> do you think so, Angie? I do. <laughs> Indeed, it's the sort of thing one can easily get a taste for. In The Field of Philippi by E. W. Hornung, dramatized for radio by David Buck, Jeremy Clyde was A. J. Raffles, and Michael Cochran, Bunny Manders. Bernard Brown played Sudborough, Adrian Egan, Bodley, Steve Hodson, Calthorpe, John Baddeley, Lapwing, Michael Deacon, McNabb, and the Porter, and James Dykes, Young Bunny. The Raffles theme music was composed by Jim Parker. Technical presentation was by Keith Perrin, and the production was by Gordon House. <laughs>